Hey guys, what is up? My name is Fritz and I'm going to be telling you why you should use the common filter. I'm going to give you a simple Pokemon example of this. Okay, so say you're trying to catch a Pokemon. Say a vicious, deadly Charmander. Okay, say something more speedy like a Pikachu. So the Pikachu is running away from you and you're trying to catch it with your Pokeball. Now, we estimate that the Pikachu will be around 10 meters. We're not sure exactly if it's 10 meters, but we know it's, it's around there. And we can map this using our bell curve, or they call it the Gaussian curve, which we can say that the Pikachu is around a mean of 10 meters. That's where the highest probability of the Pikachu will be. And then we've got a variance. So the Pikachu can either be a few meters behind or ahead of the mean. So say it runs a bit forward, and now we want to estimate its initial position at time equals one second. So for that, we use a dragon radar. I think of it as a dragon radar for Pokemon. And with that, we estimate the position of the Pikachu at around 15 meters at time equals 1. Now, what we can also use is the equations of motion. And knowing how fast a Pikachu runs, we can use that velocity. We know where the initial position is. And with that, we can estimate using the equations of motion on where the Pikachu can be. So these equations may look familiar to most of you. These are the equations of motion, so position or your final position is equal to your initial position plus your initial velocity, half times acceleration times t squared. And then you get your final velocity equals, we have our initial velocity plus our acceleration times time. So with that, we come up with a estimation of where the Pikachu will be. Now it won't be exactly where the measurement will be. Our estimation measures that our Pikachu will be around 16.5 meters. But here comes the predicament. Do we throw our ball at around 15 meters or do we throw it at around 16.5 meters? Now it makes a huge difference because if you throw your Pokeball a few centimeters ahead or behind, you know you're going to miss the Pikachu and it's going to run away. So we have to get this right the first time. We have to find the optimal estimate of where the Pikachu may be. So what do we use? Now for those who say, why don't we just use the average of the two? So we say. 16.5 plus 15 meters divided by 2, and we get a halfway mark of 15.75. But how do we know that the Pikachu isn't at 15.3 or 16.25? We don't know. And here we need accuracy. So we can't do that. So a rather better way is to take the mean and variance of the Dragon Raider estimate along with the mean and variance of our state estimate. And we combine it into an optimal estimate, which will give us the best estimate of where the Pikachu will be. And that can be anywhere in between the two means. So how do we get this estimate? Well, I'm glad you asked, because we can use the almighty common filter. <laughs> Thunder in the background. So before we move on to what and how and who what of the common filter, Let's take a step back and look at the probability density function or PDF, not to be confused with Adobe PDF. So probability density function is basically we have highest probability of one and then the lowest probability of zero. And as you can see, our measurement has a higher probability than our state estimate. So we trust our measurements more. But there are also cases where our state estimate is much more accurate. And also if there's misdetections in our measurement. Now at the moment, why this is not so accurate, or we assume it's not so accurate, because the Pikachu may be running a bit slower, a bit faster, there may be turbulence along the way, it may slip on a rock and start running again. So we assign this a low probability for now. So step one is to first to calculate the Kalman gain. So we take our measurement error, we take our state estimate error, and we come up with this equation. So what this equation means is that we got our Kalman gain, which is a combination of our error of the estimate, and over here we add our, the error of our measurement. So what happens if our error in the measurement is zero? Then this divided by this equals one. We got a Kalman gain of one. If this is very, very large, we got a large error, then our Kalman gain goes to zero. So our Kalman gain is limited to between zero and one, where zero being the estimate is stable and our measurements are inaccurate. And then we have one where our measurements are accurate and our estimates are unstable. You can go ahead and plug values into this equation and you can see that is true. Then we move on to step two, which is to calculate the current estimate. So over here we have the estimate 
at time t equals the estimate at time t minus 1, the previous position. And then we have our Kalman gain, which is the difference between the measured value minus the estimate at t minus 1. So that's at the previous time. So what will happen is our estimate will either be between 50 meters or 16.5 meters between these two points. And our Kalman gain will assign a weight that will put it anywhere between these two. And then step three, we want to calculate the new state estimate error. So we have our error estimate at time equals t, which is 1 minus the Kalman gain. And this is times our error in the estimate at t minus 1. So what will happen is the more we use the Kalman filter, the more our error estimate will start to decrease. And that's what we want. We want it to zone in on where the Pikachu will be. So these are the three basic steps that we need for the Kalman filter. There are obviously much more equations that are involved in how to derive this optimal estimate, but we won't be covering that in this video. For now, we're just going to cover the, the basic concepts. So we've got a measurement estimate, we've got our state estimate, and then we've got our optimal estimate. This is what we want to find out. Now, using the equations that we just discussed now, we can find our optimal estimate. So let's assume that we get a common gain of around 0.75, for example. Now we plug that into our equation, and what we get is an estimate of 15.375 meters, which as you can see is close to our measurement, since our measurement has a higher probability. There's a higher chance of our Pikachu being close to the measurement as opposed to our state estimate. And as I mentioned before, depending on what the common gain can be, our optimal estimate can either be at 15 meters or it can be at around 16.5 meters. Okay, so at time equals 2, let's say an unfortunate rock Pokemon just drops by and it confuses our results of our Dragon Raider. So now what's going to happen is we're going to pick up the position of the rock Pokemon as opposed to the Pikachu. Now what our common filter will do is that it will adjust itself based on what we know about our Pikachu, based on the model. We know that it won't suddenly stop just like that, dead in its tracks. It will carry on with a certain trajectory of motion. And thus, our common filter will move more towards the state estimate. Cool, isn't it? And what's really cool about this is that it does this with minimal memory. It means that it just needs the previous state and the current state, as well as the previous error and the current error, and it can work this out. Obviously, there's more mathematics behind how it works, but for now, just take my word for it and to why this is so. So again, in this scenario, so hopefully after a while, our rock Pokemon will leave the scene and it won't confuse our Dragon Raider anymore. This will in turn help our Kalman filter to adjust the Kalman gain back to the measurements thus providing us with the best estimate of where the Pikachu will be. And you can throw the ball knowing safely that you saved a Pokeball. And we all know how precious those Pokeballs can be. Let's look at some applications of the Kalman Filter. So we use Kalman Filter in every areas of life. We use it in our cell phones. We use it to track planes. We can use it to even track satellites or our cars. It's also used in areas such as adaptive cruise control, where you're trying to track a car. And if the car is occluded by another vehicle or another object in the scene, it can still track the vehicle over time. Over here is an example of how the tracking works. So we have a ball rolling over time. These are the discrete time steps. And this is our common fault of tracking. So we gave it an initial estimate, which is totally wrong. But over time, our error gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and it tracks our estimate much more closely. Now, as I mentioned, there can be occlusions, so something or someone comes in the way of our object of interest. And you can see we can still track it using the equations of motion. It's a little bit off, but it's closer than anywhere else in the image. And once when it finds the target again, we zone back in and continue to track it. So in these two examples, we use a 2D common filter, and over here we have a 3D common filter, as well as for tracking objects in 3D space. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And I'd like to know what you think of this video. This is the first video of its style. And if you really enjoyed this type of teaching, let me know in the comments down below. And if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos, I'll definitely make some. But other than that, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.